what's up, everybody? What's up, what's up, what's up? How's it going, everybody? I figured I'd turn everything on here just a couple minutes early. Make sure everybody can hear me good. Get all my levels correct. Test everything. Make sure everything is sounding good, looking good. All right. I think it's good now. If anything sounds out of line, I'll leave it up to you guys to... Let me know. As always, I appreciate your feedback. Using some new overlays here. Tim says, what software? I think it was Tim who said that, right? What software am I using? Just straight OBS, Tim. OBS, open broadcasting software. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, just uh, you just kind of set up different layouts to your liking and add different elements and you're good to go. There's about a gajillion videos on how to use it by people who are way smarter than me, uh, way more capable than me, I should say. Um, as you can see by my manipulation of the boards here live, uh, definitely uh, not necessarily the person you should be taking advice from. Uh, but OBS is the name of the software. It's a good good place to get started if you're looking to see how to put a way like this together. Cool thing is that, you know, like some of the stuff we're going to be doing tonight, like... Um, the, uh, I'll show you guys the, the keyboard overlay. Like You can do that stuff um, pretty cleanly and go direct to MP4. So if you decided that you wanted to, to kind of have that same uh, feel, you know, like uh, when we go through the, the uh, when we go through some of the stuff tonight, some of the modeling challenges tonight, I'll show you guys an overlay with my keyboard. You, you've probably seen some of that when I do the Model Monday solved uh, episodes on YouTube uh, so that you can see here, like I've got SolidWorks here on this screen and then I've got the uh, the keyboard here so that you can actually see like what I'm clicking and how my uh, how my hands are, are navigating the keyboard. You know, most of what I do with SolidWorks is it's pretty plain Jane, pretty vanilla. I'm not using like any like super custom shortcuts or anything. So if you have questions about what I'm doing, you know, let me know while we're live here tonight. Uh, I'm happy to kind of deviate a little bit from the main presentation and answer any questions you might have. Uh, but that being said, the cool thing about this software is if you're ever making tutorials for anybody, uh, it's a really quick, easy way to just kind of like set this up and make sure that you're able to uh, uh, capture what it is you're doing so you can convey to the other person like these are the shortcuts I'm using. This is how this is like when I'm moving my hand off the mouse, when I'm moving my hand over here, doing this, doing that. So um, hope that answers your question. Lots of people tuning in tonight. Appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, I hope that you guys like this. And basically, uh, the gist of tonight is that we're just going to go through and talk about what we did on Monday. So uh, I'm sorry, talk about what we did on Saturday. Um, so huge shout out to Modulci, who's in the chat here. Uh, you can see uh, uh, he's up he's up a little bit higher up in the chat. But Modulci is uh, uh, letting us know that he's here late. 3 o'clock in the morning again, so thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, Alness is here as well. He says he missed the session on uh, – actually, you know what? I'll click this over here so that I can you guys can see what I'm reading. A lot of times I like to do this just so you can see what I'm reading. Uh, so Alness here says that he stayed up too late on Friday, probably partying all night, probably doing some stuff for uh, the Mars rover or some other NASA project that he's involved in and uh, <laughs> had to stay up late and couldn't make it to the Saturday morning so, uh, Saturday morning session, so no problem. <laughs> Kim says, I'm going to bounce before the spoilers start because I still haven't had a chance to watch them yet. All right. What's up, man? Well, thanks for tuning in and saying hello. Great seeing you in here. And uh, Table 3 SIX is here. Table 3 6. What's up, Table? Thanks for tuning in. And uh, Tim Z says, Small crowd tonight. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen tonight. Maybe we'll have some other people tune in. Maybe not. This is, I feel, I feel like this is a little more for like the diehard fans here. Alberto is here. I don't think I've seen you in here before, Alberto. So thanks a lot for tuning in. And Devin is here as well. What's up, Devin and Dark and Sky Captain? So thank you all so much for tuning in. And with that, let's get into it. You know, the, the whole point of the stream tonight is to simply go through and share a little bit of uh, how to knowledge, you know, letting people kind of understand. Uh, letting people understand, you know, what's going on with uh, the wonderful world of 3D CAD modeling. And in this case, SolidWorks, I'm going to show you guys some tips and tricks for SolidWorks. And uh, Gialucia, G Gina, Gian, Gian says he likes the 2D printer sign. Thank you. Appreciate that, Gian. 
All right. So what we uh, what we do here every week, if you're here for the first time, is we have a regularly scheduled competition where you're challenged to take a 2D print and turn it into a 3D model. Um, we, we typically run these on Monday nights, but this season, season three of the show, we're actually shifting and we're going to do them on Saturdays. It's Saturday morning for me. It's uh, 1500 GMT to be a little bit more friendly to uh, those of you who maybe live in Europe or in India. Uh, give you an opportunity to compete in this thing too, and so um, you can see here we actually had somebody from Portugal, uh, Jio, on uh, on Saturday morning, this past Saturday morning, who won one of the challenges, and that got Jio a point on the leaderboard. And so you can see here that Ivan from Canada has two points on the leaderboard. Tom Smith from USA has two points on the leaderboard. Jio has one point, and Clark has one point. So this is our leaderboard right now, and ultimately we're going to hopefully uh, run this up to eight people total, and then at that point we're going to have ourselves a nice tournament on Saturday, May 1st. And I've got uh, some other videos on the channel that show uh, previous episodes of the tournament. You know, feel free to take a look at those earlier videos. But that's the gist of what we do. And a lot of times when people are competing on uh, the the live challenges, they used to be on Monday, on Model Monday Live. Now they're on Saturday. They get kind of stuck. They can't get through the model. Or maybe they just want to see the way a certified SOLIDWORKS expert goes through the model. So that's what we're going to do right now. Um, and the model that we're going to go through is going to use one of these materials, one of these unit systems. The model is called Rail Support, and this is what the model looks like. Now, when we do the challenge live, what I always encourage people to do is take a screenshot of the model. So I uh, uh, give them a view of the model here full screen, and I say, you know, this is your chance to take a screen capture of the model so that uh, you can put it on a second monitor so you can follow along with. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put this on a second monitor. So if you want to follow along with me as I'm, as I'm building this thing, you might want to do the same thing. I'm just going to take a sip of my drink while you guys are doing a control C or a, a print screen or a window snipping tool or whatever it is you're using to do this. Until F1 started back up. All right, yeah, good. good. Uh, it's nice, Sky Captain. Appreciate that comment. Uh, <laughs> all right, so so with that, uh, let's get into it here. So ready? Three, two, one, go. Right. This is what we would do during Model Monday Live. We would show the print, and we would challenge you to build the print, and the first person to build it in the chat would win. But tonight, what we're going to do on Model Monday Solved is I'm going to go through, and I'm going to build all three of these, all three of the challenges from this past Saturday. And we're just experimenting a little bit here with Season 3. If you like this format, be sure to let me know. I'll be sure to keep doing it. If you don't like it, let me know that too. Um, and then maybe we can uh, we can find something else to do that will be a little bit more useful. But for me, I always feel like when I'm trying to learn a new skill, you know, this is really especially for the uh, the students, you know, the students who are out there. Uh, this is definitely going to be something that will help them kind of think through a model and see a, a challenge the way that a certified SOLIDWORKS expert sees a challenge. So in the case of this model here, this is a rail, it's called a rail support. I've got it over here on this monitor. So uh, whenever you see me looking over here, um, I'm looking at my, my second monitor. Uh, or actually, I'm looking at my main monitor. Uh, my, my other monitor is actually over here. So you'll see me look even further over this way. Uh, but what you can see here is that uh, I'm going to be looking at this model and I'm going to be kind of trying to unbuild the model in my head. I'm going to be thinking about how are the different features going to come together to turn this 2D print into a 3D model. And so... Probably what I'm going to be looking for is where is my starting sketch and my starting profile going to be? What's the first feature in this model? So if I just look at the isometric view of the model here, what I can see is that I've got this kind of overall shape here um, that's really jumping out at me. And for me, a lot of times what I do is I really try to break down my features to kind of the, the simplest uh, geometry possible. So in the case of this feature here, I probably wouldn't even include these chamfers. Even though it's going to take an extra feature, I just feel like I can, I can get that sketch done a lot quicker. So if my first sketch is just a rectangle, just kind of this outer perimeter, and then what I'm going to plan on doing is extruding that um, probably up from the bottom. So I'm, I'm going to you know actually sketch it on this, this bottom location here. Um, and then I'll extrude that up to whatever the height is. And then I'll come in with another feature and create the chamfer. So chamfer off this corner here. And I'll create another feature to create this kind of arc here. So it's important to kind of look at a model and start to plan out the model before you start sketching. Because then you can start looking at other features of the model and kind of uh, starting to track down which dimensions you're going to need. Like the overall uh, shape of that rectangle is going to be 55 in this direction. 
Um, and then if I go down to the bottom here, it's going to be uh, 110 in this direction. So that's good to know. 50 at 110. And it's going to go up to a height of 14 millimeters. So 50, 110, 14 millimeters high. You know, those dimensions now, I want to try to kind of lock them into my head so that I don't have to keep going back and looking at the print, um, at least for that first feature. But then beyond that, what I want to do is start thinking about what's my order of features going to be? When am I going to do the chamfers? Am I going to do them right away? Like as soon as I'm done with that first block, am I going to go in and create the chamfers? Am I going to maybe create them in the first sketch? So let's figure out what the dimensions are for that chamfer. Is it, um, is it an angle distance? Is it a distance distance? You know, in this case, it's a distance distance. So that's going to be uh, important for me to, you know, to remember as I'm going through and I'm creating this geometry. It's going to be a distance distance chamfer. Um, and then what's the, you know, what's the other feature that's part of that kind of base region of the model well i think the other obvious feature is this uh, radius that's running along the bottom of the model here so that looks like it's a radius of 200 and i might not you know i'm not not rain man or anything i'm not going to memorize every single dimension on the print but certain dimensions if i just kind of read them and acknowledge them it does kind of help me some of them i do remember um, especially if they're all kind of rounded off numbers like this radius 200 i'm probably not going to forget that number so then I'm going to look at uh, the other region of the model. So, you know, I've got kind of like the bottom region of the model that I just described. So this is all taken care of now. This, this whole region here is all taken care of. So now what am I going to do with this top region of the model? And again, you want to kind of think about how you're going to be creating the, the model. Like what's the order in which you're going to create the features? So I can see that, um, you know, it, I can see how it looks from the front view here. So I can see what this looks like from the front view. But is that going to be the best sketch to create? You know, do I want to create that sketch and extrude it back the length of the plate? Maybe, you know, maybe I could do that. For me, for some reason, you know, this dimension over here, this radius 120 and this, this region here, it just kind of jumps out at me more as a, a sketch that I would want to maybe create. And then I think I would instead I would want to uh, probably create this geometry here as a cut extrude. Like that, that's just kind of what jumps out to me. And there's always more than one way to create a model. But for me, that's that's more what I'm thinking is that I, I think it would be better to create that region and kind of cut extrude it through. Um, I also, you know, when I look at this, this view here in the isometric view, it's hard to tell if these walls are angled or if they're going up vertical. But when we look at this thing in the front view, we can tell right away that the walls are just going vertical. So that's good to know, too. And that maybe is a you know further argument to create this shape here and kind of extrude this shape over. So, you know, what have we covered here so far? Well, we've covered that whenever you're trying to take a 2D print and turn it into a 3D model, you want to definitely think about the way that you would create it, uh, the order in which you would create the features. And then you also want to ask yourself, does the model have symmetry? Because if the model has symmetry, it's usually going to be faster just to model half and uh, and then mirror the whole thing at the end using a mirror all. And this model does have symmetry, and it does seem like it would make sense to do it that way. So that's how I'm going to approach this as well. So if you guys have any thoughts on this as I'm going through, feel free to put them in the chat. You guys can all read the chat. Uh, you know, Feel free to kind of talk amongst yourselves as we're going through. Tim Z here, who actually won Model Mania uh, two weeks ago. Congratulations, Tim Z. Awesome job. Uh, he's got some thoughts here. Always good to hear his input as well. Put the chamfers in the sketch, uh, and it was definitely slower. So there you go. So there's, there's kind of an interesting bit of feedback. Even though you make two features, sometimes it's actually faster to make two features. And hello from Japan. Thank you so much for tuning in. Welcome, welcome. All right, so let's take a look at how we would take this 2D print and turn it into a 3D model. And Sky Captain is coming in here with an answer. Uh, and it was a very good attempt there, Sky Captain. It is actually three places here at least. So uh, I think that's, that's your first clue that might be a little bit off there. But I'm pretty sure that was a joke suggestion anyway. All right, so let me move this over to my other monitor, and I'm going to uh, jump in here to SolidWorks and look at the title block. When I look at the title block, the title block is going to let me know what the uh, template is that I should be using. So the title block of this drawing is saying that uh, it is using uh, MMGS and plain carbon steel. Uh, this is something that you will often find when you're looking at a drawing is down here in the title block. It will tell you what the material is. It will tell you what the... Uh, what the density of that material is. It'll give you some other good information, general notes, things like that. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to go here, plain carbon steel, MMGS is my template. And then I'm going to stick to my game plan. So I'm going to go top plane and begin a sketch. So one of the you know biggest time savers in SolidWorks is just remembering that when you are selecting the geometry from the, uh, uh, from the, the tree, really when you select any face, the little sketch shortcut shows up. 
So you don't have to go up here and click sketch and then choose the sketch icon. I'm on the features toolbar up here at the top. I go to the top plane, I click the top plane, and then I just move my mouse out here to the uh, sketch command. Now, a little pro tip here um, in this kind of same uh, arena is that if you click the name of the feature, you will often be placed into a rename function, which can be a little bit annoying and uh, a bit of a time waster. But if you click the icon of the feature, you never go into rename. So you see, I click there, I move away, I click the icon again, I move away, click the icon. See, it doesn't take me into a rename function. So if I click the, the name, it's a Windows function. You slow double click on something, it goes into rename. But if you click the, the icon of the feature, then you don't go into a rename. It's a little thing, a little nuanced thing, but a lot of times you, you stack up these little nuanced things and it can definitely help you uh, to save time in the long run. All right, so I click here on this plane, begin a sketch, orient my view, and then I'm gonna press the S key on my keyboard. It's my favorite shortcut in SolidWorks. Everybody should know about the S key. I've made more than one video where I've talked about the S key because I love it. So you just press S on your keyboard. Uh, that brings up this handy, nifty toolbar, which doesn't really need to be customized that much. Uh, it's pretty good to go out of the box. And then once I choose the S key there, I'm going to go to the rectangle command. Now, uh, this model is going to be symmetric and it's going to be mirrored. So I'm just going to kind of arbitrarily choose this corner here. And then I'm going to move my mouse out. And now the height of that rectangle is going to be 55. And then the depth is going to be 110 over, or the width, it's going to be 110 over 2. So if you can't do that math in your head, you can just kind of type it in here. Now, a little... Uh, uh, caveat a little again this, these are nuances that we're talking about here as we go through these solved episodes is when the width and the and the uh, height are the same when you are using auto dimension you end up with a equals relationship ta-da uh, which is not necessarily what you want right uh, so in other words if I go s key rectangle single click move my mouse away now I've let go of, of the mouse now I'm gonna move my hand over to the 10 key here if I type in 35 enter 40 enter I end up with two different uh, sizes for that rectangle but if I do the same thing here and I type in 35 enter 35 enter I only get one driving dimension and I get a relationship now the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I've been in a lot of spots where I knew that was gonna happen but I wasn't sure uh, uh, if I actually wanted that. Um, as the design iterations go on, you may find that uh, you might want to change that later. You know, you, like maybe it starts out square, but you know that it's going to change. Like one of the sides is going to get a little longer just from your experience with the project. So in those spots, what I will usually do is just kind of manually... Uh, put in the wrong dimension, and then just double click on the dimension to change it back. So in other words, I would go 55, enter, 56, enter, then I would hit escape here, and then I would take that 56 and turn it back into 55. Right? It's pretty cool. Uh, good, A good little trick to know. The other thing that, that I use a lot when a model is going to be symmetric is that the... Uh, uh, when you do a revolve in SolidWorks, you can drop in a center line and then you can revolve about that center line. So if I was making this into a hockey puck, I might uh, click here on this uh, doubled uh, on this on this center line and then cross over the center line. Let's say I'm going to make that 150 and then I'm going to do a feature revolve. And so now I'm going to turn this into a hockey puck. Right. So now it takes that linear dimension and it turns it into a diameter dimension. And by the way, the reason that happens is because I revolved about the same line that I double dimensioned to. Uh, when I when I created the revolve feature, I said revolve about this center line. So, so when I go in here to the revolve feature, you can see here that this is the center line which is chosen, this line 17, and that is the same line that I created the double dimension to. So SolidWorks automatically put a diameter symbol here. If I, if I didn't revolve about that line, if, if I go in here to this axis of revolution and I click on this line here to revolve about, which is different, from the line where I got the double dimension, well, now I just get a linear dimension without the diameter symbol. That's usually the, the way the question is phrased. Usually people will say, how come I'm not getting diameter symbols anymore when I do a revolve? You probably revolved about a different center line, or maybe you revolved about a solid line, but you dimensioned to a center line. But that's not what we're doing here, right? So, so uh, I'm gonna control Z for undo. Now I'm back in the sketch. Um, and what we're doing here is we're attempting to create a doubled dimension of 110 
for the sake of a downstream mirror all. So I'm going to mirror all about this center plane here. I'm just going to draw half the model and mirror all. But it's important that when I give this dimensioned print to the customer, they see 110. The, the customer doesn't want to see 55. The customer wants to see 110. So how can I make that a little bit easier? I can use that same double dimension. So I can go dimension here, double dimension to this line here, cross over the dimension, right? Make that 110. And then just extrude half of the model, right? I don't need to extrude the whole thing. Just extrude half the model here, extrude this up to 14 millimeters. And then eventually I'm going to do a mirror and eventually I'm going to do a mirror all. And then when I double click on the model, I'm going to see the, you know, the proper, uh, you know, double dimension for all those mirrored features. So it's just kind of a cool thing to remember. Normally we would use that double dimension for a revolve, but in this case, we're going to go S key extrude. Then we're going to take our hand off the mouse again, and we're going to type in 14, enter, enter. So we never have to go, uh, we never have to go up to here. We just kind of, you know, come across. Infinite lines. Tim says, uh, yeah, I like using infinite lines in this scenario. I never, I've never used infinite lines. I've never used them. I just never got into them. I, I never used another CAD program that really used them. And so I uh, just didn't use it. But yeah, that's a great point. You know, if you use an infinite line, then you can clearly see that the intention of that line is to be the center line. And it makes it probably a lot easier to select it when you've got, you know, a lot of lines overlapping. So maybe I'll give it a try. I'm drinking a nice... Uh, Ginger lemon kombucha tonight. One of my favorite drinks. All right, guys, I know I'm running I'm running down the clock here. I, I'm taking way too long on this. You guys probably all would have beat me by now on this one, but uh, let's keep moving forward. So I'm just going to go S key uh, chamfer, and I'm going to make this a chamfer of distance, distance. So here I'll choose this option for distance, distance, and I'll make it symmetric uh, at 13, or I could do asymmetric, and then I could just type in 13, 13. Uh, but in this case, it's symmetric 13, 13, either one. It doesn't matter. You know, again, if the, if the print had 13, 13 on it, you know, if I think, if I know this customer, I know this customer sometimes changes it, I might do it that way. And that way, when I go to, you know, show the drawing, I'm going to see both dimensions. Um, but you know, that's, that, that's requires a little bit of knowledge of the customer. All right. So now I'm ready to create the, uh, uh, lower, I can create this kind of lower arc cutout. Honestly, for a great big cutout like this, I probably would just save that to the end. Probably, you know, instinctually, my next feature is going to be this feature here. And this feature here was definitely the tricky feature of this model. Most of my models have at least one tricky feature, and it's because of this radius 120. Um, and I tried to call it out in a way that everybody would recognize, like, the center of the radius 120 is over here, right? It's It's to the right of the backside of the model. And the reason that's important is because when you go to create this feature, and in this case, I'm gonna be creating it from center, I'm gonna pick this face, begin to sketch, orient my view, and I'm gonna to go to my uh, uh, line command. So I'm gonna create a line that comes over here. I'm gonna create a line that comes up like this. And then when you're in the line command, if you just, you don't have to click any buttons or anything, if you just go back and touch the end point, you can come off of that end point with an arc and you can drop an arc here like this. And now you have easily created an arc which is tangent to this line here. But because it's tangent to that line, what that means is that the center of the arc is coincident to that vertical line there. And uh, that means that when you go and you put in your other dimensions, like this dimension here is at 21, and then you go to put in this arc here, it says, hey, the arc's already fully defined. All right, well, as long as it's 120, we're good to go, right? So I hit OK, and the arc radius is 82, so there's a problem there. So that was kind of the uh, the real like gotcha on this model. Um, that was definitely the, the most tricky part of the model. And so what you have to recognize is that this coincident relationship down here needs to be eliminated. So I press delete there. Um, this dimension needs to change back to driving. And then this dimension needs to become 120. Otherwise, you are not going to get the correct mass. And now we're going to go to a distance here of 54 divided by 2 because I'm only doing half the model. I'm going to right mouse button. I'm going to say reverse direction, and then I'll right mouse button again to finish that command. And then I'm going to go to this. This next sketch could be drawn on the back or it could be drawn on the front. Um, this is the sketch that represents the uh, rail that's running through this thing. So this thing's called rail support. So there's there's some kind of like a pole or a rail that that runs through this thing. It sits on this thing. This thing catches it with these 30 degree um, angled uh, braces here. So, you know, now I need to create the sketch for that geometry. Um, 
It doesn't really matter where you sketch it. I'll just sketch it here on the front. It probably makes more sense to sketch it on the back just from like a uh, practical usability standpoint, but it doesn't really matter where you sketch it. I'll sketch it on the front and just blast the sketch uh, through with the cut extrude. So you can see here that this is a uh, uh, construction circle at 35 degree, uh, millimeters. It's got a center here, which is right in line with the 21. So it really makes it easy to create certain features when you're mirroring the model. You're giving yourself that nice uh, kind of center center point geometry. So I'll just take that sketch, click on it, come up here, make it for construction. Then I'm just going to do my uh, you know line over here, come down, try and touch off on that tangent. If I can catch it as tangent in one shot, all the better, right? Because um, now now I've got a tangency relationship there in one pass. So, you know, this this down here is tangent as well. Uh, this is fully constrained. The only thing I really need here is the angle dimension. And with the angle dimension, what you want to remember is that SolidWorks has this really cool thing where if you click on an angled line and then you click the end point of that angled line, you get this little four-way arrow. And if you click on one of these little four arrows here, you can see that you can move up and then you can make that at an angle of 30 to an imaginary vertical line. Now, you could have just as easily dimensioned it to this line here, right? You could have just made these 230. That would have been totally fine too. But it's just kind of a cool thing that SolidWorks has that little imaginary dimension line. I like that. S key, extrude cut, right mouse button, through all, right mouse button again to finish that. That gives us our extrude cut there. And now the final two features are the whole wizard features and the uh, kind of cut at the bottom. So here again, front plane, begin to sketch, orient the view. And now I'm going to S key and uh, create my circle here, vertical to the origin uh, because I've got symmetry, uh, centerline symmetry on this design. Uh, radius here of 200, which you remember from before. Uh, it looks like vertical didn't actually pick up there as a true relationship. So vertical. Uh, and then what we can do is we can just bring this thing down. Uh, that's radius 200, not diameter 200. So 200 uh, over, no, times two, right? Radius 200 over two. <laughs> so good at math. All right. And then what we can do is we can just, there's a couple of ways you could do this feature here. You could, you could convert, convert this bottom edge and then just trim it. Or you could, um, uh, you could create a point. That might be another way, like make a point here and then uh, intersection point this thing. So you could take a point here and then take these two and make those coincident as well. So now you have that intersection point and you can make that at 100. Did I do this wrong? Was I right the first time? This should have been 400, right? Yeah. And then you can see here that this is going to be a distance of 100 across the center here. So once again, we could do the center line trick or we could do the math trick, either one. So this point here to this, we could put on this side and say 100 over 2. Or we could just cross over the center line and make that 100 so we get the dimension on our print. Of the two methods, I actually prefer just trimming this up and making it a nice uh, trimmed sketch. But, you know, you can go either way. All right. And whoops. It was meant to be a through all. That's one of the tricky things about the cut extrude command is that if you do something like reverse direction, before you can right click again, you have to kind of move your mouse away. Otherwise, you're going to right click to green check mark. So I need to like move my mouse away, then right mouse button, then through all, and then there we go. It gives us that. And now the final feature here is just the whole wizard hull. With whole wizard, if you just remember to pre-select the face, that definitely helps you uh, save some time. You don't have to uh, get in there and make the extra click when you go to position. So right now, it, it automatically knows. You can see from the red sketch origin, it automatically knows that I'm in a 2D sketch on this face. Um, you'll notice here if I if I do this this similarly but different if I go whole wizard and then I go to positions it doesn't actually know what face I want the whole wizard to be on yet so I have to click this face first and then I have to click it again so for me I always just kind of pre-select a planar face when I'm doing whole wizard it, it's just uh you know it's just kind of like a old school technique but it, it works well and, and kind of helps to keep things straight so I'm going to go here to this hole. This hole is going to be ANSI metric. Uh, usually what I do with hole wizard counter bore, I just pick uh, the custom sizing rather than trying to go through and figure out like what the appropriate size is for the standard. I'll just go through here and I'll just say five through, press tab. Then I'll do, uh, let's see here, this is diameter 10 for the counter bore, press tab, four for the counter bore depth, go to position. And then I will click here and here. And then I will hit escape, uh, Nice thing about whole wizard in the old days, you would hit escape and it would actually boot you from the command. Now it lets you continue. So I'll make those two points vertical, uh, do the little center line trick again here. 
this really isn't necessary you could just do the math in your head or you could do the math divided by but it, i think this is good to know when you're when you're actually doing production prints you know if you're on a speed run um you would do this a little bit different but um i'm trying to teach people that you can be fast and you can still be accurate you know you can be both oops i think i was still stuck in that uh, double dimension function so this is 10 and then this is going to be 25 all right, here we go. Moment of truth. Let's mirror this. So this is going to be mirror. And then what we do is we say this is our mirror face. And we don't say features to mirror because we would have to go through and pick all these features from the tree. And that would be uh, that would not be fun. Um, and they might not even rebuild properly because uh, end conditions try to solve when you make a pattern. I have a video on that. If you watch my video on geometry pattern, it talks about that idea. But uh, you can see here that if I now go here to bodies to mirror and then I click on this face here or this anywhere on that body, hit the green check mark, uh, the two bodies merge together and that gives us our final model, our finished model, hopefully. And then we go to evaluate and we go to mass properties and we can see here that the mass is not a uh, six. 32.95 so 633 grams is the answer i'm coming up with and so we would enter that into the chat we would say 633 grams and then we would uh you know see if anybody else got any faster and then i would keep talking for a while uh maybe interviewing the guest or whatever i'm doing but eventually i would say here is the correct answer everyone yes we did it got it right 633 grams so that is uh, an example of Model Monday Live Solve. I'm going to do two more for you tonight. The next two I'm going to run through just a little bit quicker, um, but I just want to kind of start things off a little bit lighter. What's up, Tamborora Station? Thanks a lot for tuning in. Table 3.6 says, got the right answer, but used a lot more features. That's okay, man. Listen, Table 3.6, it's not about having the least amount of features. Um, and really, it's not even about... Uh, uh, it's not even about making your models uh, quickly. It's really about being able to look at a model that has 10 or 20 or 30 features in it and being able to say, if I change that dimension, then I know this, this, and this will happen. You know, Or it's about being able to look at that feature tree and, and you've renamed the features in a way that you can just jump right to the feature that you need. That's what matters. That's what's, that's what's going to make you a champion. Uh, the speed will come over time, but don't. it's never about like doing it in the fewest amount of features. That doesn't matter. Um, and a lot of times for me, you know, I make something in two features that somebody else might make in one feature uh, just because it's it's actually faster to do it in two features uh, because I can get done, you know, cumulatively, I can get done faster. Uh, even though it might seem like you can get it done faster in one feature, you might be doing a lot of trimming, especially with a complex sketch, uh, and, and you don't need to do that. So it's all good, man. Okay, let's see here. Minimum number of features is four. Uh, not sure if this is actually fastest way to model, though. Yeah, exactly. Tim Z, completely agree. Completely agree. All right, and RK is here as well. What's, I mean, RK is here as well. What's up, RK? Uh, is there a shortcut for double dimension? Could you do multiple double dimensions at once? Yeah, that's not. A, that's a great question, uh, RK. And it's not a shortcut. It's, it's just the way that it works. Um, it's kind of cool, actually. When you are... Creating something that is uh, running along a central shaft, if you will. Uh, so you'll see here, if I go to create something like this, which is running along a central shaft and is going to be revolved. Um, and then I've got my center line here where I'm going to do my double dimensions. What you'll see here is that if I go to create the double dimension, so the first dimension I go to create, it has to be to this line, okay? If you, if you go to create the dimension and you create it to this end point, it doesn't work, it doesn't double. Uh, so it has to be to this line. So you, you go across this line here. And uh, then what you'll see is that when I go to drop that dimension, so I'll make that 180. Now I'm going to go to create my next double dimension here. It actually assumes that you're in this double dimension mode. It gives you kind of a special icon. It's like a dimension with a center line and the letter D on it. So it assumes that you're in the double dimension now. And then when I go to this next dimension here, it does the same thing. It still assumes that I'm in that double dimension. And then if you um, wanted to create like the height between these two, well, when I pick this line here, now um, I, I'm kind of like auto jumped back into a regular uh, linear dimension mode. I guess because that line's perpendicular to the center line. I don't know. I don't know what it's using to solve that, but that that would be my guess. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, great question. The only uh, shortcut that I know about to um, 
uh, that, that you have to use when you're doing double dimension is if you're doing an angle for a double dimension. So you'll see here if I go to uh, double dimension, say this point to the center line, all the way to the line, you can see I can drop that in there and I can make that 180 for the double. But if I go to do this angled line here to the double dimension or to the center line and I cross over, see, it doesn't happen. You get like the um, explanatory angle or, or uh, whatever it's called, the supplementary angle. I forget what it's called. But uh, you can see here that if you hold the shift key on your keyboard and then move across, then you can see you get the doubled angle dimension. So that's really good if you're doing a manual uh, C-Sync uh, and you want to call out what the angle is for the C-Sync. You can get in here and you can make that, you know, whatever it is uh, for your for your countersink or whatever it is you're doing. Um, or really, I mean, there's a lot of any, any kind of lathe application you're doing uh, that could be useful. So doubled angle dimension you can do by holding the shift key. Great question. All right. So speaking of revolved parts, uh, our next challenge here uh, from Model Monday Live on Saturday it was actually Saturday speed running, uh, which was getting people points. Uh, to get into the tournament, I think uh, I didn't write down who won each of those. I think that first one was uh, Jio. I think he won that first one. And I think Tom won this second one. It, I might have had those switched, though. Um, you can see here that this next one looks like this. So I'm going to just jump this over to full screen in case you are interested in taking a screen capture of this. You are more than welcome to do so. Just in case you want to follow along with, I'll leave this up here just for a few more moments, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, jump this over onto my other screen. All right, here we go. Here we go. Hope that was enough time for everybody. All right, so the wheel model. So uh, again, starting plane, starting profile. Right, it's, that's where we always start whenever we're creating models in SolidWorks. Starting plane, starting profile. So for something that's revolved. I'm, you know, I'm going to be looking to figure out what's my revolve sketch going to look like. And in the case of this model, I'm hoping that I can create a center line here right through the center of the wheel. And then I can create the shape of the outside of the rim. Now, you know, ideally what I'm going to do with that rim is I'm just going to draw two circles here. So like front plane, begin to sketch, orient my view. And I'm just going to draw two circles here and then extrude them. And boom, now I got the, uh, the rim. But uh, it turns out that the rim is actually on a 15 degree angle here. So the rim's on a 15 degree angle. So maybe I'm not going to be able to do that. So probably my first sketch is going to look something like this. If I put this in blue so it's a little easier to see. First sketch is going to look something like this. So I've got this um, polygon on one end of the model, center line here, and then I'll revolve that. And that will give me the first feature, the, the rim of the wheel. Now, next question is, do I do the hub next or do I do the spoke next? And I think for me, I'm probably going to do the spoke next because my, my thought is if I do the spoke, if I if I create the spoke here, the spoke comes up at this angle, this uh, looks like it's 10 degree angle here. So if I create the spoke here, then I can create the the center hub and then I can create this keyway cutaway last. And what that'll do is it will allow me to create the spoke all the way here, all the way to the center, right? Um, and and then I can just kind of like merge that into the hub, and then uh, and then cut extrude it through with that uh, keyway hole at the end. So that's that's what I'm thinking as far as a game plan. Um, you know, it depends on the geometry of the model if I'm going to do the hub first. But I think in this case I'm probably going to do the hub later. I'll probably do the spoke first. So now I want to just look at the geometry of the spoke. And what I'm going to see here when I look at the geometry of the spoke is that the spoke is an ellipse. It's an elliptical shape. Ellipse is a uh, type of sketch feature that we have. It's a you know mathematical geometric feature uh, that you can you can reference. Uh, so it's going to be elliptical in nature. And it looks like it has non-uniform height. So the ellipse actually has the height changing. I even put a note here on the print. The ellipse height changes with the 10 degree taper. So in other words, when I'm looking at that section view BB, the uh, 10 millimeter width is constant throughout the entire duration of the spoke, but the height of the spoke changes here as we uh, go from point A to point B. So what that means is I'm going to have this green line here. This would be my, uh, this would be what's called a guide curve. Sorry about putting that over top of the other text. And then I'm going to have this red line here. This is going to be what's called a path. 
And then I'm going to have uh, the ellipse itself over here. This is what would be called a profile. So this is a sweep with two features, a guide curve, a path, and a profile. Now, I did an episode of Model Money Live a few months ago where I did tips on sweeps. I think the thumbnail has me holding a broom, uh, tips, uh, tips for sweeps, something like that, uh, where I talk a lot about this idea of having a path and having a guide curve and a profile. Um, very important concept to understand. Even with seemingly basic geometry like this, it can really uh, open up your, your capabilities in the world of 3D modeling. So here's what we would look at. Uh, this is MMGS and 1060 alloy. So MMGS 1060 alloy, top plane, begin to sketch, orient the view. Start out with a center line here. Probably create another center line in this direction too, just to kind of make things a little bit easier when it comes to making that mirror. Uh, it looks like this thing tapers down to the lowest point on the outside. And I can use my smart dimensions here, my auto dimension, just to kind of get me close. Uh, I don't actually know what that width is uh, at the peak. So I'll just kind of eyeball it up here uh, all right something like that and then I'm gonna do what's called a crossing select and then this menu here if you right mouse button you can choose customize it's the menu that shows up whenever you select something well for sketch mode when I select something in sketch mode I wanted the mirror function to show up automatically so I added that so I took the mirror function here and I drag and dropped it onto here. It's one of the few things that I've done in SolidWorks. I've, I've customized this and I've customized the S key and that's about it. Everything else, pretty much vanilla. Um, I changed the icons to green and yellow because I'm old school like that. Uh, but you know, pretty much vanilla out of the box SolidWorks. But that is one that I've changed and I use that one all the time. And that's why I changed it. So when I do, whenever I do a window select uh, or a multi-select and I've got solid lines and a single center line, this menu option comes up and I can click on it and just insta mirror right across. And so now I can say that this is 15 millimeters and this angle here between these two is 15 as well, 15 degrees. And then distance from here to here is the OD of the wheel, which is in the main front view at 185. And then uh, distance from here to that same line here, you can see I'm getting that double dimension automatically, is a diameter of 150 for the ID of the wheel. That gives me the geometry for the rim of the wheel. I'm gonna hit escape and I'm gonna pre-select this line because I've got two center lines. Center line here, center line here. And when I jump into the revolve command, SolidWorks isn't gonna know which center line to use. Now I could just tell it right here if I wanted to, right? No problem, I can just do it there. But I like to pre-select, so I'm going to first click this line and then I'm gonna go revolve, boom. That gives me the revolve shape that I need for the wheel and we're cooking. We're ready to move on to the next feature. So that gives me that first feature of the wheel. Now I'm gonna move into the, uh, you know, that gives me what I would call the rim, uh, this outer shape here. Now I'm ready to move into the next feature which is called, I'll call it the, the spoke. Um, and this is going to require three sketches, three sketches total. We always create the path first. Path is always first. Whenever you're doing a sweep, you might think like, I'm going to make the profile. I know what the profile looks like. Why don't I start there? That's not how you do it with sweeps. You always make the path first. A little counterintuitive, I know. You actually make the profile last, uh, believe it or not. So I go front plane, begin to sketch, orient my view, and I'm going to S key line and create a line that goes from the center of my model to the rim. I'm going to hit escape, and that is it. That is my path. So I would call this spoke dash path. All right, next sketch. Sometimes I'll write mouse button on that, and I'll go sketch color, and I'll change the color of the path just because it makes it a little easier for me to see it. Front plane, begin to sketch, orient my view, and I'm going to create a line that will start around here and come down at an angle. And this line is going to have its end point vertical to the end point of the path. So I'll take those two points and I'll make them vertical. But there's also going to be a point on this line which is coincident to the rim. And the reason for that is because of this dimension here, which says, Elliptical spoke at wall. So where the spoke hits the wall, there's a driving dimension of 15 millimeters. Now, this particular model had a tolerance of plus minus two. So if you, you know, if you missed that, uh, you'd still be well within spec. But there's other, there's other spots where, you know, you might not get that luxury. So I've got the uh, uh, end point here of the path, which is going to also be vertical. This isn't necessarily like a, a hard and fast rule that this should be aligned 
and this should be aligned. But if you make it a habit to do this, it's less likely that your sweeps will fail. Uh, they won't. Uh, they won't yield as many errors, like uh, uh, or even terminate, uh, bef you know, prematurely before they get to the end of the uh, uh, the path. Uh, so if you just make these aligned, it just kind of like cuts down on the amount of troubleshooting you need to do if something goes wrong with the sweep. And now finally, I'm going to add my dimensions. So again, I can do the kind of center line trick here. I can say this is going to be from that point that I created from this point here to that center line, and then across. That's going to be 15 millimeters. And then, whoops. There we go. And then this is going to have an angle dimension here of, it's 10 millimeters total. I'm just going to do five because uh, it's 10 total. All right. And that is our spoke guide curve. So I'll come over here to the tree and I'll rename this spoke guide. And then I will right mouse button, sketch color. Again, probably not on a speed run, but uh, in, in the real world, I usually do something like that. And now I can go to a plane which is perpendicular to the path. A lot of times what I do in this spot is I make a new plane which is perpendicular to the path. So I click the path and I click the end point. Now I've got a new plane there. Now that happens to be coplanar to the right plane. So I could also just use the right plane here. But um, very important that you create a plane perpendicular to the path. <laughs> Very important. Uh, whenever you're doing sweeps, that is the correct way to do it. That's why you need the path before you need the profile. And you save the profile for last. So now in this sketch plane, I'm going to create the profile. The profile is going to be an ellipse. And the ellipse is going to have its center point pierced. Not coincident, but pierced. Always pierce when you do a sweep. Pierce is the correct relationship, not coincident. So you'll notice when I when I went to create the ellipse, what I could have done is I could have just created the ellipse here and created the ellipse like that. Yeah, that would have worked. That would have been fine. And in this case, this is a pretty simple sweep. It probably would have worked. It probably would have been fine. But the correct way to do it is you always pierce when you're doing a sweep with guide curves and with the path. So you always pierce to the path and you always pierce to the guide curve. Very important. And uh, another thing that, you know, you'll you'll learn a lot about as you learn more about sweeps and lofts with guide curves. But uh, just you know, for now, if you take nothing else away, just like, oh, I didn't know Pierce was so important when you're doing sweeps. It is. It's really important. Okay, so now that uh, looks pretty good for the spoke. I'm going to exit that sketch. That's my spoke profile. And then I'm going to sweep that profile along that path. So profile, path. And then I'm going to go in here to guide curves. I'm going to say I also want it to follow this guide curve. And because the profile is pierced to the path at the center point and pierced to the, the guide curve at this quadrant point of the ellipse, the ellipse has to taper in on the bottom as well. Uh, so you only have to do on once because on a one quadrant because the ellipse has symmetry at the sketch level. That symmetry is going to be enforced throughout the duration of the sweep as well. So that's your spoke. And now we are ready to circular pattern that spoke. So we could do circular pattern here. We could say we're going to circular pattern about a circular edge. We could say there's going to be six instances. And this is the feature that we're going to pattern. And we get a nice little uh, preview there. And we go to hit the green check mark. And it barks at us. And it says it can't do it. But it does say try using geometry pattern option. And so I hit geometry pattern. And then I try it again. Boom, it worked. So I have a video about geometry pattern. If you want to learn more about geometry pattern, check out that video. Uh, that'll definitely help you understand why feature patterns fail, but then work when you geometry pattern. It's basically because uh, end conditions are often trying to solve and uh, the criteria for the end condition to solve is not present when you do the pattern. Um, but long story short, geometry pattern just makes an exact geometric copy and doesn't worry about solving end conditions. So here I'm going to go front plane, begin to sketch, orient the view, um, and then I'm going to make a circle. I noticed with this circle, it was kind of like sketchy to like figure out where the actual origin was. And so in that spot, what you could maybe do is just rotate the view a little bit, and then you can uh, make sure that you're getting right on the origin since it's so busy in that region. The other thing that you could do in that spot, I've done this plenty of times, is you could just sketch the circle out here. So this has got this has got a diameter of 50, and then you can hit the origin here in the tree. 
So I'm hitting escape so nothing is selected. Hit the origin in the tree, hold control, pick the center point of the circle, let go of control, and then make those coincident. When it's like really busy in that center region, that's something that I'll sometimes do. S key extrude. This is going to go out to a depth of 25. Enter. Then I'm going to move my mouse a little bit. Right mouse button, mid plane, right mouse button. There we go. And then I'm going to pick this face, begin to sketch, orient the view, S key, circle, and I'm going to make a circle here with a diameter of 25, S key, extrude cut, right mouse button, through all, right mouse button again, and then pick this face again, S key, rectangle, and then I'm going to make the keyway. So you'll notice that I decided to make the keyway as a separate feature, even though I could have done it all in one sketch, just because I think it's faster for me personally to do it that way rather than trying to trim that sketch up. Uh, I just think it just I can just blast through those two sketches and I could probably do it faster than I would uh, take to trim that sketch up but you know you could do it either way uh, if you're more comfortable just trimming up that first sketch that's fine too here what I would do at the end is I would probably take a section view from the top um, and then look at that view so control five you know control one is your front view uh, whoops, control one is your front view, control four is your right side view, control five is your top view, control seven is your isometric view. These are good uh, shortcuts to remember. They're built right into the software. Um, and then what I would do is I would kind of compare that view to this view here and just kind of give it a quick look over like, yep, that looks right. That's what I was expecting to see. Um, if that looks right to you, whoops, uh, if that looks right to you, then you are ready to move on and we can find out if the answer is correct. So here I will escape out of that. Go to Evaluate Mass Properties, and I put myself into a markup. <laughs> evaluate Mass Properties, and we got 536.23, and the correct answer was, let's look at our slideshow again. So nervous. Correct answer was, 536 plus or minus two grams so pretty big tolerance on that one uh you know 534 up to 538 but i mean ultimately you probably either got the spoke or you didn't but that's the um that's the spoke model i hope you guys like that i hope that gave you some new tips and tricks that you can work into your workflow uh the wheel you know sweeping make sure you use a pierce command always important um uh, i was hoping we would be done by like 9 30 uh, so 20 minutes ago, so I know I'm running a little bit over here, but I actually see that we're uh, increasing in number of viewers. So we'll do one more model here. Uh, maybe next week we'll go through a little bit quicker. Ultimately, uh, this competition we run every week is going to allow you to earn points on a leaderboard, and whoever is in the top eight on that leaderboard by May 1st is going to land themselves in a heads-up international 3D CAD modeling speed running tournament. So excited to see who makes it on uh, May 1st. Uh, excited to see everybody there. It is the same day as the Kentucky Derby. So, All right, let's move on here. Uh, question came in in the chat here from uh, Simran. What's up, Simran? It's been good seeing you here the past couple of times. Uh, for CSWE coupons, you want to contact the certification team. So I think the email is certification at solidworks.com. Uh, and you can ask them, uh, you can you know clarify what your question is. Uh, and they'll they'll be able to help you out. Like if you had a voucher and, and didn't get to, to cash it in or something, um, they'll be able to help you out with that. All right, so this one was called Pod Mount. Um, this one I thought was pretty cool. I was I this is one of these models where when I made it, I remember thinking to myself like, oh, I wish I could see this one in the tournament because in the tournament you can actually see how people are using the software and how they're coming up with the solution. And there's a couple of different ways you could do the front. Uh, nozzle of this thing and I think the way that I do it is probably a lot different from how uh, you know how you might have approached it or how somebody else might have approached it and what I'm referring to here is this region here in the the front of the model this um, oops let me flip back here so this region here in the front of the model so you've got this kind of like uh, side view here I know I know I'm losing the one corner with the keyboard cam but you've got this kind of side view here this is probably gonna be my starting plane starting profile so start on the front plane I'll probably bring it out mid plane because this model has symmetry but this region here I think was really interesting um, and I was very curious as to how to, how other people did it if you did this model let me know in the chat how you did that that region of the model because what's tricky about this is that we've got 30 degree uh, chamfer, draft, whatever you want to call it here in the in the front view. 
But then we've got a 45 degree here in the top view. So how do you do that? Like, how do you do the, the chamfer at the different angles? Do you do, like, I, I don't know, how do you do it? Do you do it with two different chamfers? Do you do it with cut extrudes? I actually did it some way totally different. Uh, uh, and I think it'll be maybe interesting as to how I did it. But I'm curious if, if anybody else maybe did it the same way that I did it. So if I'm looking at this model, again, uh, starting plane, starting profile, you know, where are we going to start with this thing? I'd say you could either start by sketching this shape on the top, you know, and then cutting the curve out. But I would probably actually sketch this shape here on the side um, and then extrude it across. And then I would do, the, you know, probably tackle this front region here that we just talked about. And then I would finish up maybe with like a cut extrude from the top. So cut extrude from the top here. And then we've got this hole here that needs to be punched through. And we've got this hole here that needs to be punched through. That's, you know, just giving this thing kind of a quick once over. That's what jumps out to me. And that's what you, you always want to get yourself in the habit of doing that. That's why, you know, I take so much time to explain this when I'm doing these solved episodes is that, you, you know, you got to remember to uh, to figure out how to uh, think through a model before you actually jump into it. And that doesn't mean you have to stick to that plan. You can always deviate from the plan a little bit, but you have to kind of think through like what you're going to do. So for me, and I see uh, table three, six, says i wanted to use draft and that's exactly what i was thinking too uh, i was thinking to myself i want to draft this this region here but how am i going to draft this region because like i'm pretty comfortable with draft with like neutral plane draft but if i if i make this first shape here all one shape so if i for example if i come up here 30 do my little arc here come all the way out to here to 100 you know come back down now that's let's say that's my starting plane starting profile well, how am I just going to draft that region, right? Am I going to do like a, a split face maybe to draft that region? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. How am I going to go about doing it? I mean, one way that you can do it is you can just straight up do it with a cut extrude. So I'll show you what I mean by that. And then I'll show you how I, how I actually uh, did it. Like how I, you know, how it jumps out to me. Um, so if I'm, if I'm doing this competition myself, this is how it jumps out to me. So here's one way that you could do it. You could go uh, start here at this point. So starting plane on the front plane, come over 100, the full distance, come up uh, 45, come back this way a smidge, uh, come away from that end point, come back, touch the end point with your mouse, come off of the end point like so, come down like so. Uh, this is going to be at a height of 30. And then this radius here is a radius of 65. S key extrude. And we'll do that uh, mid plane. And we'll take that out to a distance of 65. And then what we could do is we could go to our top view here, begin a sketch and sketch a triangle uh, with a distance of 20 and a, an angle of 45. So we could absolutely do this. Oops, I turned on a... Uh, a selection filter there. Yeah. So we could absolutely do this, and then we could go extrude cut, right mouse button through all, hit the green check mark, and then we could go here, front plane, begin a sketch, and we could do the same thing here. Right? This definitely works. Um, and we could do the same thing here. Oh, that looks nice. Totally did that on purpose. Then we could do extrude cut, and we could do right mouse button through all right mouse button. It works. It gets you the right answer, right? I tested it there. Uh, definitely uh, works. You know, another way you could maybe do it would be when you get out to this point, you could uh, you could maybe try to chamfer this. So let's say we do chamfer and we go um, angle distance, and angle distance here is going to be twenty and forty five, and then from the top view, that's going to be on these two edges. And then I'm just going to press enter to repeat the last command. And then I'll make that one 20 and 30 degrees. And then I could do this here and this here. And that bottom one looks correct. But this one here, I have to click on it and do flip direction. So you see, depending on which edge you click in the, in the uh, selection box, only one of them will flip directions. So you can do that. Yeah, that looks like that'll work too. So you can definitely do it like that as well. But neither of those really jumped out at me for some reason. For some reason, for, for me, the way that my brain is wired, uh, I was thinking draft all the way. And so what I ended up doing was 
in my first sketch here, instead of going the full 100, I took it 100 minus 20. So I made my first sketch look like this, just come out to 80. And then I did pick a face, begin a sketch, orient the view, and I did a convert entities, S key extrude, and I brought it out to 20. But then I said, don't merge the results. So I unchecked merge results, which gave me a separate solid body there. And then I hid this solid body and I did a neutral plane draft. And it's a little bit of a weird way to do it, but I just think it's always good to kind of see different ways that people will approach uh, these different kinds of challenges. So in this case, I'm gonna say that this is gonna be 45 degree draft on this face and select other, this face back here. And that is going to give me those two from the top. And then I'm gonna repeat that command. So I'll go draft and I'll say this face um, and I will say this face and right mouse button, select other, pick that guy down there. And that gives me those two, except that was supposed to be 30. Now we can show that other solid body, which you can do show and hide with tab and with shift tab. So when you're doing multi-body, you can do that. You can do that in assembly mode, uh, and you've been able to do it in assembly mode for a long time, but just a couple of releases back, you were able to, to do it there. And then you just go over to the tree here, and you hold control and pick both of these guys. So I'm just holding control, picking this, hold control, pick this, let go of control, right mouse button, combine, and that's going to let you take those two bo solid bodies and turn them back into one single solid body. You know, I love solid bodies. I love multiple solid bodies. So uh, it definitely is the reason why I, uh, I think I probably chose to go that way. Uh, but, you know, it's just, again, it's just kind of a cool way to realize that there's, there's a lot of different ways to think through a challenge. And so even a challenge like this, you know, this one single feature here, you saw like three different, there's three different ways. There's probably another way you could probably, um, if you could do the math or maybe lay out the guide curves, you could probably loft it. That might be another way to do it too. So now uh, we just have our final features, our cut extrudes, which we saved to the end. Uh, so this face here, begin a sketch, orient the view, S key, click here, uh, come up, whatever that distance is. We don't really know what the distance is. We do know this distance though, so 30. You know, so when you're when you're doing the uh, auto dimension while you're sketching, you don't have to necessarily dimension every single entity, uh, but you know, do the ones that you know. Um, this is also 30. It's it's six, dimension to 60 total, but it's also 30. Uh, I can do that math in my head. That's how good I am. And so this is going to be for construction. Window select. Jump right to that mirror shortcut again. Like I said, I use that all the time. Uh, I just think it's such a nice, handy shortcut. And that's why I customized it. And there we go. Fully defined sketch. Look how fast we're able to get that fully defined. S key extrude cut. Right mouse button through all. Right mouse button again to finish. And we go here to this end of the model. Select a face. Begin a sketch. Orient our view. Uh, S key circle. Take the circle here at 15 uh, say that we want it to be vertical here. You could use the Ivan exploit on this circle for sure because uh, it is uniform wall thickness, but I'm going to do it the right way. Right mouse button uh, through all, right mouse button again. And then finally, one last hole on this side. Select face, we get a sketch, orient the view, uh, select this uh, S key circle. So, you know, this is, this is, you know, when you're when you're doing a lot of engineering, a lot of these things do come up. And that's why I like to include them in these challenges, uh, even though it may seem like it's repeat, repeat, repeat. It's just every time you get faster, you do this for 21 years and you'll be as fast as Tom Smith. Or 23 years. Can't remember how long he said he's been using. 23 years sounds more right. There we go. We do the kind of final look around this thing. Make sure that we got everything on there. I think that all looks pretty good pretty much like the print. So let's go to evaluate mass properties here. And we got 131.96. So that would round up to 132. If we come back here to the uh, PowerPoint, we can see here that the correct answer is yes, we did it. We got there. So that is going to be it for tonight. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed that Model Monday Live solve. I figured this was a good opportunity to share the solutions for some of these models. Um, I was trying to do it with their own kind of individual videos, but uh, I just have a lot on my plate right now, and I wasn't really getting to them, and so I figured maybe this is a better format. We'll see how it goes. If you guys enjoyed the presentation tonight, please let me know in the chat. You can give me a one in the chat if you liked it. Give me a, a zero in the chat if you didn't like it, if you didn't think was a good format um, and I think that if you're watching this in the replay you can also let me know in the comments because um, we're doing a little bit of experimentation here with season three with kind of uh, changing the the time with uh, 
Zexus, that was a CSWA problem. No kidding, man. I got that model from uh, uh, I got that model from one of my old engineering books. Uh, that's a lot of times that's where I take my kind of um, uh, influence from. I look at my old engineering books and I uh, figure out from the old engineering books kind of what. Uh, would look like a good model and then i have to i always have to modify them a little bit um they never they always have like too much geometry in them too many dimensions or too much detail or i just want to change it just to like make the mass a little bit more manageable uh so that's interesting though that that one ended up in the cswa as well maybe they maybe they went to the same uh, uh went through some of the same classes i've gone through i don't know <laughs> i'll have to ask them about it so but hopefully that'll help you you know if you're doing cswa that'll maybe help you get through it as well so I appreciate all the feedback. I appreciate all the ones in the chat. I'm glad that you guys found this helpful. Uh, let me know what your, uh, before you leave tonight, let me know in the comments what was maybe one or two of your favorite tips that you learned in the presentation tonight. If you uh, didn't understand those before, if there was like a, a feature in there that you didn't know about before, let me know what that feature was. Uh, if you have time, I know you got to go. I know we're running a little bit late here, but um Try the A, mo a key in sketch mode sometimes. Is that the, does the A key uh, move you through like the different parameters of your, uh, well, I guess I can just try it here. Let me just try it real quick. Shout out to Sky Captain. What is up, Nick? Uh, let me just see what the A key does in sketch mode. I thought the A key was the one that like moved you through all the different options. Um, so here, let me go to rectangle. Yeah, that's what it does, okay. So if you guys look up here in this region, and then what I do is I press A on my keyboard. You can see that it moves through each of the different options for rectangle, you know, or whatever it is you're doing. I think I'd probably use it the most with arc to quickly move through the different types of arc commands. Now, one way that I kind of, uh, oh, A, oh, it adds the curve. Gotcha. Yeah. So, okay. So what Nick is talking about there is um, something that I'm not, I am not eligible for. And the reason I am not eligible for it is because here in sketch mode, I have enable on-screen numeric input turned on. That's auto dimension uh, mode in sketch. So here, what Nick is talking about is if I go to the line command, start creating a line, and then I press A on my keyboard, it jumps me into the tangent arc command, right? And then I can I can come down here and then I can press A again, and it jumps me into the tangent arc command again, and then I can I can come down here like this. The problem is that because I use um, auto dimension in sketch mode, so here enable on screen numeric input, when I begin to align command, I get a dialog box that's looking for a text input. So for example, I could say I want that to be 20 millimeters in length. And then for me to create the, uh, the, the tangent arc, what I do is I come back here with my mouse and just hold my mouse over that endpoint, and then I come off with a tangent arc. And so now what I can do is I can say I want the radius for that tangent arc to be six millimeters. Um, and then I can create another line here going up uh, at a distance of, say, 25. And then I can come back and I can click on this line here, and you can see that I can now input another uh, radius dimension. But what I cannot do is I cannot press A because A just ends up landing in that radius dimension. Uh, and similarly, when I'm going to create the line, I can't just cr press A. So it is good to know about, Nick, but I am not eligible for it because I use auto dimension in sketch mode and uh, it's always looking for some type of a text input. Cool. Use table, th uh, table three, six says use bound. He used boundary instead of sweep for the spoke. Uh, yep, that's that's definitely another way to do it. Um, I would think in that spot probably sweep would be probably would be better, but uh, or just like a little more straightforward. But yep, uh, uh, boundary is always you know like any once you learn those tools, it's like everything's on the table, right? Everything is everything is an option uh, when you know how to do like boundary and loft and sweep with guide curves. Everything is like they're they're all so similar that a lot of times they're interchangeable too. All right, awesome, guys. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. I'm glad you enjoyed this. I'm glad everybody learned something. I will try to chop up these videos and make them uh, individual videos so they're a little more consumable. Feel free to share them with other people that you know. Let other people know they can tune in on uh, Saturdays. I think our next one is on Saturday the 27th. Yep, Saturday the 27th at 1500 GMT. And I will look forward to seeing everybody there. And, of course, uh, 
uh since it seems like people like these types of sessions i will definitely uh try this out again next week tambor station giving a shout out to sky captain saying hey i like the a key now i'm gonna start using that that's awesome tambor station glad to hear that too all right everybody i will see everybody next week have a great rest of your week and of course let me know if you have any questions down in the comments we'll figure it out together bye bye everybody Thank you.